want to welcome to our 930 in the morning Sunday service from Doctrinal Studies Bible Church in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, today's lesson uh, comes um, from a series that we did in 2019 uh, from our Tuesday night Bible study. We did uh, 44 lessons on the life of Joseph. Uh, this lesson didn't come from it, but we're going to put it in it in our series called The Life of Joseph, done on Tuesday night in 2019. We're going to add this lesson to it um, called Living a Lie. And it comes from Genesis, if you have your Bibles, it comes from Genesis 42, 18 through 23, and it deals with the ten brothers of Joseph attempting to kill him sold him into slavery, that, that crime that they committed and covered it up thinking that no one would be the wiser, God is always the wiser. Anytime you think that nobody will be the wiser, God is always the wiser. And this lesson will teach you that. Now, in what has transpired by the time we get to chapter 42, because this crime was committed against Joseph that was called evil, in uh, chapter 37, we're now in 42, 22 years later, th these 10 brothers have lived a lie for 22 years and covered it up, thinking that out of sight would be out of mind, Listen, not only is it not out of mind, God is still very much present in that act of awareness, but so are the brothers. Out of sight, out of mind? Mm -mm. Not even 20 years of time and other activities of your life could fill this living in sin. So what we have 22 years later is a confrontation. God has brought this to a head in the life of the 10 brothers. In chapter 42, verses 18 through 23, I'll read it. We'll have a word of prayer and we'll get into this. Now Joseph, he's the prime minister of Egypt now. He is 30 years of age. It happened when he was 17 in chapter 37. Now Joseph said to them on the third day, Do this and live, for I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers be confined in your, pri in your prison. But as for the rest of you, go carry grain for the famine of your household. And bring your youngest brother to me so your words may be verified and you will not die. And they, and they did so. It was then that they said to one another, truly we are guilty concerning our brother. They're talking about Joseph 22 years ago. Because we saw the distress of his soul when he pleaded with us, yet we would not listen. Therefore, this distress. Look, it went from their distress to this distress. The distress in committing a crime against their brother. 22 years later has resurfaced as part of the distress. Did you get that? Make sure you get that. We saw the distress of his soul 22 years ago when he pleaded with us, yet we would not listen. Therefore, this present distress has come upon us. Do you see that? Reuben answered and said, did I not tell you so? See, there's always somebody in the crowd that's going to say, didn't I tell you so? Yeah. Why don't you do anything about it? Did I tell you so? Yeah, but you were still part of the ten that sold them. Didn't I tell you so? Do not sin against the boy. 
and you would not listen. Now comes the reckoning for his blood. What they didn't know in verse 23 is that Joseph, the prime minister of Egypt, for there was an interpreter between... They did not know, however, that Joseph understood, for there was an interpreter between them. Now, Joseph had an interpreter translating from Hebrew into Egyptian. But they don't know the prime minister is Joseph, although there's something about it that's very familiar that has triggered this in their soul something that's laid, buried for 22 years is up and running. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about today in detail living a lie. They've lived a lie for 22 years and it's caught up with them. And that's a good thing. Remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't learn it, can't live it. In carnality, evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude type of sins. It could be mental attitude. It could be sins of the tongue. Or it could be over, overt sins, like in our story. Overt sins. What do you have to do to get out of carnality and back to spirituality? As a believer, you have to confess your sins. 1 John 1, 9. If I confess my sins or if we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I give you a moment of silence to do that. Important for Bible study, the Holy Spirit teaches and recalls the word of God, John 14, 26. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your love, mercy, and grace. I pray today for this lesson upon our life. How many believers have tried to cover up a sin and have lived in the lie of it? And when God confronts it like in a story today or a lesson like this today that jogs your memory so that that distress now becomes this distress, it's time to deal with it. And I pray today, Father, for those who need to deal with it. This will be the day of reckoning. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today we're going to look at the brothers living a lie for 22 years and how it affected not only their lives, but the lives of other people in the family. It affected their father's life when they came home and told another lie, came home and told a lie to him that spread, affected the entire 66 people. It, it, it affected the entire patriotic family of 66. All of them. Oh, 66 is found in the 46th chapter of Genesis, verse 26. Living the lie of sin spread through the family like the, the COVID-19 virus has spread uh, from China throughout the world and especially in America. Paul warns about living a lie, living a sin, knowing it is and not reckoning with it, not dealing with it. Here's what Paul said. Paul said, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Their sin they committed against Joseph was committed against Jacob, and now the entire patriotic kinfolk family. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. In 1 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8, he tells them, clean out the old leaven. Clean out the old leaven. Deal with it. Put off the old man and put on the new man. Confess your sin. Change, make restitutions if, ne if needed. Pull it out of the closet. Get it out in the open. Deal with it in God's way, not your way, God's way. Clean out the old leaven so that you 
may be a new lump. You see, they're never going to be a new lump because the old lump is leavened. Now watch what Paul says. You, so that, clean out the old leaven, so that you may be a new lump, new man, divine viewpoint thinking, just as you are in fact unleavened because of Christ, our Passover has been sanctified. Why would you carry on when, with sin covered up, thinking it's never going to be exposed, going on with your life, and now all of a sudden your life is stalled because you haven't dealt with this sin. You have lived a lie about sin. You haven't dealt with it. 22 years they haven't dealt with it. They haven't dealt with it. They swept it under the rug. They buried it in the backyard. Nobody know. Let me tell you, God knows. The lie was a cover-up of a terrible crime committed against the, the brothers against Joseph in Genesis 37. Then he, they came home and carried another lie to Jacob that spread to the rest of the patriarch family. Now let's look at it. They did five things. They committed five acts against Joseph. First of all, they plotted to murder him. Then they thought, hmm, that might be too heavy with God, with us. So here's what we'll do. We'll throw him in a water pit that's dry, a deep water pit that's dry, and let him die of natural causes. If you throw him in the pit, he's not going to die of natural causes. That's a crime. Then... Some traders headed to Egypt come in, some slave traders from headed to Egypt come in, and they decide that they'll sell him into slavery. I mean, why not get a little why not get a little bit of money out of it? And they sell him like Judas sold Christ. Instead of 30 pieces, they sold him for 20. We studied all of this. And if that wasn't enough, they realized that they had to go home and tell their father something. When they pulled him out of the pit, they took the coat of many colors and sold him into slavery. They took Joseph's coat, killed one of Jacob's goats, soaked the coat of many colors into one color, blood and death. They took it home and presented it to Joseph, uh, to Jacob, took Joseph's coat home and presented it to Jacob as evidence of Joseph's demise. We couldn't find the body, but we sure found the blood. Their father accepted it, and they lived the next 22 years with that lie to their father. What the brothers did to Joseph was so traumatic that it left a large imprint upon their souls for 22 years. We know that from Genesis 42, verse 21, which we just read. When they said to one another, truly we are guilty concerning our brother because we saw the distress of his soul when he pleaded with us, yet we would not listen. Therefore, this distress chapter 42, has come upon us. Look, 
here's another lie in their soul. This is what happens. Once you get into sin lying, get into lying about sin, it's like chain smoking, you know, where one is lit right off of another. Listen, they're saying that the, God is paying them back for this. God is paying them back for sin. Are, are you listening to this? I can't tell you how many believers believe this stuff. That God is paying you back for sin. Listen, never, never, never does he pay you back for sin. He don't punish you for sin. You know why? He punished his son. His only begotten son, he punished him for your sin, my sin, present sin, past sin, future sin, once for all. God doesn't punish you for sin. He punished Jesus for sin. The judgment of God was upon Jesus for sin. Once for all. You're going to be judged for that. Oh, tell me. Once, once, once you begin covering up one sin for another sin, for another sin, for another sin, it gets wackier and wackier what you believe about your life and relationship with God. In 1 Thessalonians 5.15, Paul mentions two things. He says to see and to seek, and they're imperatives. He says, see that no one repays another with evil. He puts it in the imperative. Never, never, never. See, see that no one ever repays. Why? And it should be obvious. Listen, who wrote that? God. God said, don't let anybody pay back evil for evil. You think that God is going to do it when he tells you not to do it, that God is okay to do it? No. And when he says seek, he says, seek good, not evil. That's, a, that's an imperative. You see, these brothers are living a lie committed by sin and evil. And it's, it has dominated their life. Even though they said, well, we've gotten on with our life, we're doing fine. Are they? Have they? Not with God. Not with God. How do you think you're doing? How do you think you're doing? You're not doing any better than, Joe, than uh, the, t the ten brothers. I can tell you that. I can tell you that right now. Let's look at four things. Let's look at four things. About how do you recover from the guilt of the living of the sin lie? How do you recover it after 22 years? You might say to me, who cares? Well, I don't know where Joseph is. Dad's about to die. He talks about it every day. I, oh, I, I don't have no reason for living. Who cares? I'll tell you who cares. God Almighty. Your Heavenly Father cares. He wants you to clean out the closet. Everybody wants to talk about coming out of the closet. Let me tell you, the church is full of people that need to come out of the closet and get their life cleaned up. Quit hiding it. You can't hide it from God. You can't hide it from God. You see, point number one, in, eva in evading the truth. I mean, how many times do a parent say to the child, just tell the truth? Just tell the truth. Just tell the truth. What is so difficult about just tell the truth? I tell you who doesn't want you to tell the truth about sin and lying. Living the lie of sin and evil. Let me tell you. The devil. Because Jesus said in John 8, 32, you shall know the truth and that truth will set you free. So why not just tell the truth? What are they doing? They're evading it. The brothers are evading the truth. 
And in doing it, they have sentenced themselves to 22 years of emotional, mental, physical, and spiritual pain bondage. They've also put their father Jacob through it and the larger family, patriarch family, in a similar distress over the loss of a loved member of the family of a horrible death. They chose to live the lie as twisted truth with the facade of living a normal life. This is a believer living by old man cosmos diabolicus thinking, which is conformity to the world that Satan rules, the God of this world, 1 John 5, 19, rather than new man divine viewpoint thinking, the transformation by the renewing of your mind to the will of God, Transformational living is living the dynamics of the will of God every day, every day, every moment of every day based on your spiritual growth mentality. Romans, the 12th chapter, verse 2, talks about the difference between conforming to the world and transforming to the will of God. Ephesians 4, 22, 23, 24, talk about put off the old man by the renewing of your mind, put on the new man. You do know that. Here's the second thing, living a lie. The quicker you get it out, the quicker you deal with it, the better your life will be and the greater your relationship with the Lord. He'll not hold it against you. What he holds against you is the unconfessed sin. He, di he disciplines you for it. They don't recognize this as discipline from a loving parent. They see us as a, a parent getting evil with them, e even with them. Not so. They attempted to hide the lie, this personal sin against Joseph and Jacob, which was an overt sin, to sweep it under the rug, to push it out of their minds, to justify it by saying Joseph deserved it and getting on with their lives as if nothing happened. You see, this is the greater lie that they told themselves to justify getting on with a normal life after they put their brother through an unbelievable ordeal and crime. They were hoping that it would magically, or at least by time, eventually go away and be forgotten. For, for 22 years, they have lived with it by pushing it out of their minds, listen to me, but not out of their subconscious. Out of their conscience, yes. Out of their subconscious, no. How do I know it? Because when God... Not when they decided, but when God, not Joseph, not when Joseph decided, not when they decided, but when God decided enough's enough and intervened. Only then were, were they brought to a place where they could actually acknowledge it, confess it, and deal with it. They would have said in their testimony, out of the blue, 22 years on with a normal life, and out of the blue, <laughs> I like that phrase because when God intervenes, it is out of the blue. God steps into earth atmosphere in, in symbolic terms and deals with an issue. God intervenes out of the blue, not for God, for them, yeah, out of the blue. So out of the blue, out of the blue, they had a traumatic experience, unexpected, in Egypt by a new young prime minister who had a lot of similarities of Joseph. And it rung a bell. It triggered their guilt ridden subconscious. They talk about it in chapter 42 that I read to you. 
What has happened over 22 years of living a lie is simply this. It has built scar tissue upon their soul. It has caused them to become hardened and calloused to the things of God and to good decisions, what the will of God is, and that ought to do it no matter how it might appear or look or how it make other people think, well, Ron, after 20, I've built my, myself into a pretty good reputation. Uh-uh, not with this stuck on, on you. Your reputation didn't come from God. It won't until you deal with it. You say, Ron, where in the world do you get this idea of scar tissue, the hardening of the heart? Well, go to the New Testament with me to the book of Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verse 18. Here's what it reads. Being darkened in their understanding, and this is these brothers, being darkened in their understanding excluded from the life of God because, there's two because. First, because of the ignorance, because of ignorance, when because of the hardness of their hearts, because of ignorance, and because of the hardness of their hearts. See the word hardness? That's scar tissue. That's callousness. I gave you the Greek word. If you have, the, if you have your paper, porousis. It's mentioned in 2 Corinthians, the third chapter, verse 14 as well. You see, they built scar tissue up over 22 years, which has affected their consciousness, but not their subconsciousness. See, they've covered up the consciousness of their sin. Get on with your life, sweep it under the rug. But what they couldn't is their subconscious. You see, the subconscious, the subconscious is the original record without sugar coating. It's the original record. When they, when they say, I remember his distress and his screaming bloody murder and pleading, they are reliving the episode. You see this in, in military men from combat who come home. They, th they think they've gotten rid of it. They haven't dealt with it. They've just swept it under the rug and pushed on and think, well, that's what war is. War is hell. And then all of a sudden, at the right time, when they got enough information to be able to deal with this in a way that's structurally positive in their life, God, put, God intervenes. It brings them into a truthful understanding about it all. cleanses them and makes them whole. This is what God desires for them. It's whether or not they've got the courage to do it. Here's third point. It is at this point that God intervenes with his overruling will. Now, you've got to understand something about three categories of the will of God that are really important for you to know. You need to get a pencil and paper. Jeez, by now you ought to know this. You ought to know you ought to come to a Bible class with a Bible, a pencil, and a piece of paper. Even if you have a study guide, you ought to have a pencil in your hand. You ought to have a Bible next to you. Three, three, three. there's the directive will, the permissive will, and the overruling will of God. You can see it all over the Bible. Study any character. I like Jonah because you can see it very clearly in Jonah. But, the directive will of God is what God reveals to you personally through categorical Bible doctrine. In other words, God reveals something about his will for your life, makes it very clear to you. He says to Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh, and I want you to preach the gospel. I want, those, I want to get those people saved. There's children over there that need Christ. All right? There's the permissive will of God. This is what God allows you volitionally to choose against the revealed word of God, the directive will of God. 
Jonah salutes and says, yes, sir, gets on a boat and travels the opposite direction away from what God called him to do, as if he could sail, in the, sail away in the sunset and God would never see it, God would never know it, and he would be okay. See, it's not, not your will, God, it's my will. My will trumps yours. I'm going to tell you, I can't tell you, if that's you today, your, your will will never trump God's will, never. The quicker you learn it, the better your life will be. His will, it, listen, Jesus said it, not my will, but thy will be done. I mean, it can't be done. It couldn't be done by Jesus himself. Who do you think you are? My goodness, people, who do you think you are? You need to come to grips. Then there's that overruling will of God. When God intervenes in your plans, your will, on behalf of the plan of God, God's will, he intervenes and gives you an opportunity to change it. I'm offering you a deal. Get out of the conformity of the world and get into transforming, but it will require the renewing of your mind. I'm asking you today to recruit, renew, renew your mind. Just like these brothers have got to renew their minds. You've got to step out of conformity to the world. Stop playing the game with the world. The world doesn't give a hoot for you. They're sick and going to die and go to hell, and they would like your company. Not as a believer, but you can be sick and miserable in it. They are. When you die, you're not going to go to hell because you're into sin. But you're going to be disciplined to come out of it. Hebrews, the 12th chapter, 5 through 11. The overruling will of God has forced the brothers to face the reality of their sin and living a lie and to come to grips with it and deal with it according to the will of God. In Genesis 50, verse 20, when Joseph finally confronts them with a peace offering, what a mature guy. What you meant for evil, he told them, God meant for good. Think about that. Romans, the 8th chapter. Verse 28, God always means good things for you. God's will is that everything be good. All things work together for good to those who are called according to the will of God. In Psalm 66, 18, let me tell you what the last, Psalm 66, 18, let me tell you the 22, last 22 years have been like for them guys. If I regard iniquity in my heart, God will not hear me. If I regard iniquity in my heart, God will not hear me. But once I confess it, he will listen to everything I have to say. 1 John 1, 9, if I confess my sin, he's faithful and just to forgive me and to cleanse me. That's a restorational pivot. What sin would be after 22 years? Well, they know which one. We heard him pleading for his life. So we sold him into slavery. They think that was a good deal. Got a little money out of it. Don't have the guilt of actually killing them, murdering them. Then they go high. Then they go home and pitch this ungodly story to their father that wrecks his life. My, my, my. 
let me tell you, if they don't come to grips, come out of the closet, stop living the sin, stop being conformed to the world by the renewing of their mind, be transformed by the renewing of their mind, be transformed by the power into the image of Christ where it's not about you, it's about him. I mean, this is the day of reckoning in their life. This is the day of reckoning. But let me tell you what they won't have. And they could have if they'll confess their sin and come over to the will of God again. If they'll come clean and, listen, if they'll come clean with their sin and get cleansed by the blood of Christ for it, they'll get inner peace. They've not had it for 22 years. They'll get inner peace with God. Inner peace with God. Romans, the 8th chapter, verses 5 through 8. In verse 6, the mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. Do you see the difference? For 22 years, they've had their mindset on the flesh. Always, anytime something comes, every year, you know, Joseph on, on, on uh, Jacob on Joseph's birthday, you know, who. The mindset on the flesh is death. The mindset on the spirit is life and peace. They, they need both of those. They need spiritual life. And they need peace with God. Philippians 4, 6 through 9. Colossians 3, 15. All great passages on this subject. O man, cosmos diabolicus thinking conformity to the world of the brothers protected projected old, old man cosmos diabolical thinking of the brothers projected their suffering as God punishing them for this sin here they are with Jacob Jacob's threatening them I mean uh, they're before Joseph the prime minister of Egypt they don't know it's Joseph and he's threatening them I put you in prison. I'm going to keep one in prison. You bring me your young brother. If you don't bring him, eh, you're in trouble with me. Death. You either die of the famine or you come back here. I'll put you in prison until you die. Old man, cosmos diabolical, thinking of the brothers, projected their suffering as God punishing them for their sin which is nothing more than another lie and another avoidance technique. This is no spiritual solution to their problem. Therefore, you must understand this. I don't know what. This ought to be a number four. God does not punish people for their sins of the past, present, or future whether an unbeliever or a believer, God put all the sins of mankind on his son while on the cross. Now, as an unbeliever, if you poo-hoo this idea that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, which is the gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, you leave this life without Christ, you will await the great white throne judgment and you will be cast into a lake of fire forever and ever. There's punishment. But in this life, as long as you're alive and have volition, you can come out of it. You've got to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. You've got to believe that he died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead to give you life and life everlasting called eternal life. And he gives it by grace through faith and not of yourself. It is a gift. If you pass this deal up as given to you today, you pass this deal up and die, you're done. You're cooked, literally. Talk about a cooked goose. John the Baptist in John 1.29, Behold the Lamb of God that's come to take away the sin of the world. 
Jesus to Nicodemus in the third chapter, verses 16 through 21, goes in and explains to him how important he must be born again. If you live this life and die without Christ, you have nothing. but the awaiting of the future judgment called the great white throne, Revelation 20. I'm telling you the absolute truth. Jesus, when he died on the cross, he said something very important. He shouted, it is finished. The Thales die, in the perfect tense, meaning the work of redemption for sin was completed, and it was completed forever. You enter, when you enter to salvation today, you enter a completed work. It's not based on you. It's based on the person and character and work of Jesus Christ. Hebrews, the ninth chapter, verse 12. The blood of Christ was shed once for all to obtain eternal redemption. Verse 14. The blood of Christ cleanses our conscience from dead works to serve a living God. In Hebrews, the ninth chapter, verse 28, Christ, also having been offered to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, second advent, for salvation without reference to sin. We eagerly await him. How about all that? See, sin is the first coming of Christ. That's where it's all dealt with. Old man cosmos diabolical solution to a, spiritual to a spiritual problem only creates more problems. Ask the brothers. What have we learned? We have learned from this lesson that avoidance and denial doesn't set one free from sin, nor a life of it, nor allow one to experience inner peace of God. This comes with confession of your sin as a believer or believing the gospel as an unbeliever, where you can receive the peace of God by grace. Either side, it's grace. It's not works. And what is the result? Psalms 103, verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. What's the point? Peace through the blood of Christ. For the believer, spirituality, coming back into a full, powerful relationship with God through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. For the unbeliever to have Adamic sin, the 13 judicial charges of Adam's sin removed from your life once and for all. Go to our website, doctrinalstudies.com. Pull down. You'll see 50 things. Pull it up and take a look at it. Pull it up and take a good look at it. Study it. Study it. Well, living a lie, there's hope for you. Come out of the closet. Get real with God. This lesson is one of those intervening times in your life where God brings it to a head. What are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with it? You're going to confess it as sin. That living that lie, that sin lie, you're going to confess it. You're going to quit, quit living conformity to the world and start living transformed by the renewing of your mind to know the will of God. How do you get to the will of God? Here it is. The word of God takes you to the will of God, and the will of God takes you to the work of God. That work relationship that you have with God doing his will. I've given you a ton of scriptures today. I've explained it all to you.
Get these notes and study them. Go back and listen to this three or four times. And come to grips with your life. What you're living and what you're spreading is so much worse than the COVID-19 virus. It is so much worse. Get right with God. Get right with God. He is asking you to do it today through me. Get right with God. Confess your sin. Get back in the word of God. Get into a Bible teaching church. Seek God's will. Get into our study groups. Get on our internet. Look down. There's tons of information on there for you. Father, we're so thankful today for these that have come our way. We pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth to their lives. They need to come out and come clean. Confess their sins and be cleansed by the blood of Christ through the confession. If I confess my sin, he's faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me. Restore me to spirituality and a relationship with God. Quit running from God. Start running for God. To God, for God, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.